Hi everyone, and welcome to Biology Professor. Today, we're going to be looking at several different vocab words that have to do with viruses um, or other infectious agents. So virus, virusoid, viroid, prion, plus like 10 more. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, but before we do, I want you to know that you can get free study notes by using the URL that's in the description below. So that will be a free PDF of the entire finished board with all of the uh, notes written on it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about several infectious agents. That's going to be virus, virion, some of these subviral agents, prions, and bacteria agents. Now, all of these infectious agents that we are talking about today, um, I think we need a U there, actually, infectious agents, these are all acellular, okay, acellular, meaning not composed of cells. Certainly there are infectious agents that are cellular, bacteria, um, helminthic worms, uh, fungal pathogens, um, protozoan pathogens, and so on. But here we're just talking about infectious agents that are acellular, so not composed of cells, simpler than cells. Let's get started with the most obvious one, the one that most students know, and that is a virus. Now the virus consists of a protein coat and that protein coat is called a capsid. It's made up of like protein subunits called capsomeres. Um, and that protein coat or capsid surrounds a core of nucleic acid. So the nucleic acid can be DNA or RNA. And that just depends on the specific type of viruses. Some viruses use DNA, some viruses use RNA um, to carry their genetic material. So the virus is something that can replicate itself, so capable of self-replication, as long as it's infecting a host cell. So it's an obligate intracellular parasite. That means it must infect the host cell to be able to replicate and cause the disease that it causes. Um, and then these viruses may or may not have an envelope. Um, now, I have a much more in-depth video called Introduction to Viruses that goes into viruses, their different shapes and their different structures and their replication cycles. So you can check out that video, Introduction to Viruses, if you want to learn more about viruses. But now let's go on to some of these other similar vocab words. We've got virion, okay, virion. This is the infective form of a virus, specifically the infected form of a virus that is outside of a host cell. So it's outside of a host cell and it has the capacity to infect a host cell. That's a virion. So if you're looking at virus replication cycles, um, one of the, the, the last step of that cycle is usually release. That's the release of all of those offspring or progeny virions outside of the host cell so they can kind of float away and infect another cell. So that infected form of the virus outside a host that has the capacity to infect a host cell, that's the virion. Now we're going to talk about three different subviral agents. Now subviral agents, these are infectious agents that are smaller, smaller than viruses with only some of their properties. So as we go through these three different subviral agents, you're going to see that this, this is consistently true. They're going to be missing things that are found in viruses and having some properties of virus, but missing other properties. So let's start off with viroids, okay? Viroids are known for infecting plants. Um, so this is an infectious plant pathogen. It's made of self-replicating, so it can replicate itself as long as it's inside a host cell. Circular RNA. So these are always circular RNAs. This is without a protein coat. Okay, so they don't have that protein coat that caps it that a full virus is always going to have. This is literally just circular RNA that can self-replicate if it gets into a plant cell um, or a specific plant cell, right? Whatever type of plant it infects. It also does not code directly for proteins. Viruses are um, going to code for the proteins, 
you know, both proteins that make up the coat, but also sometimes their own enzymes, and that's going to be missing from fibroids. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of fibroids. If you go Google thyroid, you'll get a, a whole long list of examples of different plant pathogens that fall into this category. Now let's talk about the second type of subviral agent, and that is virusoid. So a virusoid, again, is an infectious plant pathogen. Like all known viroids and virusoids are plant pathogens. This is different from a viroid, though, because it's made of non self replicating genetic material. So while a virus, or sorry, a viroid is like a virus in that they're self replicating, a virusoid cannot replicate itself. Even if it gets into a host cell, it can't replicate itself. It can be made up of circular or, this is another kind of difference from a viroid, or linear RNA. So a virusoid can be made up of circular or linear RNA. The viroid is only circular RNA. Still without a protein coat, but what makes the virusoid able to replicate, since it cannot self-replicate, it has to infect a cell at the same time, that's this co-infection, with a specific, what we call helper virus. So only if the virusoid gets into the host cell where another virus uh, can, is already replicating to serve as a helper, only then can it replicate because that helper virus is going to have the machinery through which this one will be able to replicate, not by itself, but with the help of the helper virus. Now let's talk about the third type of subviral agent, that's the satellite virus. Similar to a virusoid, but actually encoding one or more of their own enzymes. So viruses, again, the viral DNA or RNA, whichever one it's using, it's going to encode for um, its, sort of its own proteins and some of its own enzymes. And the satellite virus is similar, but it's still non-self-replicating. The satellite virus still requires co-infection with the helper virus. Um, one example, of a human pathogen that is a satellite virus is hepatitis D. Now I have seen textbooks, particularly older textbooks, that will actually classify hepatitis D as a virusoid. In fact, the major microbiology textbook that I use in my class used to characterize hepatitis D as a virusoid. But now it has been split out into this related uh, category of a satellite virus because it does encode like one of its own enzymes. So hepatitis D, again, it still needs co-infection with a helper virus that's usually going to be hepatitis B so that it can, can replicate, and that is a, a human virus. Let's go on to two more infectious agents. Let's start with prions. Prions are misfolded proteins. And this really kind of rocked the scientific world when this was discovered. For quite a while, scientists believed that prion diseases were caused by just some kind of virus they hadn't found yet. And the scientist who ultimately, you know, was able to show that it's just a misfolded protein and not like a full virus, um, that was a, a big shift. In, in the scientific knowledge around these diseases. Prion diseases include things like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, um, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which is the kind of fancy name for mad cow disease. Um, another prion disease is Kuru. If you want to learn more about prions, I do have a full length video on prions that you can check out. Um, but prions, they do cause progressive disease in humans, progressive meaning getting worse with time. And currently, as of the, the filming of this video, there is no cure for any prion disease. And so if you contract one, it will ultimately be legal. And then the final infectious agent we're talking about is a bacteriophage. This is also called um, a phage. So bacteriophage or phage, you can call it either one. This is simply a virus that infects bacteria. Now I have a video called transduction, which is a form of horizontal gene transfer in bacteria that uses bacteriophages. And in that video transduction, uh, I'll talk more about bacteriophages, what they look like, how they replicate. And so make sure you check that one out. Now we're going to go into some sort of similar related vocab. This, these are words that don't refer directly to an infectious agent, 
but they are related in some way. So let's go ahead and get started. The first two, prophage and provirus. These are very similar. A prophage is when you have a phage genome, remember that's a bacteria phage, a phage genome that has integrated into the host genome. And you'll see that depicted in my transduction video, but that's where you've got a phage, its genome gets like injected into the bacteria cell that it's infecting, and then actually integrated or incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. Provirus is very similar, except instead of being a phage in fact, infecting a bacterium, this is an animal virus that's infecting an animal cell. So an animal virus genome that again has integrated or incorporated into the host genome, we call that a provirus. Um, HIV will form a provirus when it infects um, human cells. Its DNA can actually, or its um, genetic material, which is actually RNA, gets reverse transcribed into uh, DNA, and then that gets incorporated or integrated into the host's genome. Um, now let's talk about virulence. Virulence is the degree to which one of these infectious agents is pathogenic. Basically, how you know, how severe it is. So we would say that, you know, a strain with higher virulence is more pathogenic, causing more severe disease. A strain with lower virulence or, you know, a less virulent strain would be something that's less pathogenic, that if it causes some kind of symptoms of disease, they would be uh, more mild if they were from a less virulent strain. Virulence factor is a product, something that the pathogen makes that assists in its ability to cause disease. Um, for example, some uh, pathogens will make certain enzymes that help them to cause more disease. So I have videos on the coagulase test and the catalase test, which is ways that you can determine in a laboratory if a particular bacterium produces coagulase or produces catalase. Both of these are enzymes that assist in, their, in, in a pathogen's ability to cause disease. And so they would both be virulence factors, coagulase and catalase. So you can check those out if you want to learn more about those. Viremia, you know, anytime we see emia at the end of a word, this is the presence of virus in the bloodstream. So in the blood. Um, if you have, if a, if a patient has viremia, like an infection in their bloodstream, that's a very, very dangerous situation. You never want to have um, large amounts of virus in the blood. Now let's talk about a viricide. A viricide is a chemical or a physical treatment that destroys or inactivates the virus. So maybe you've heard of something being a bactericide or a fungicide um, or something being bactericidal or fungicidal. That means that, that it's some kind of treatment that would destroy the bacterium or the fungus. Um, and a viricide is basically the equivalent for a virus, some kind of um, medication or, or chemical that is viricidal. That means it would inactivate or kill the virus. Whew, and now we're getting down to that very last one, viral titer. Viral titer is the number of virions. Remember, virion is talking about the infected, the infective form of a virus outside of a cell that has the capacity to infect a cell. The viral titer is the number of virions per some unit of volume. Um, and most commonly, I think you see milliliter. So for example, um, you know, 100 virions per milliliter of blood. That's an example of a, of a viral titer. A higher viral titer means a higher viral load in that, um, in that organism. A lower viral titer would be a, you know, fewer viruses per unit of volume. So that's the end today. Make sure that you subscribe. Make sure you hit that bell icon for notifications. Make sure you check out some of these other videos to keep learning. I wish you all the best in your studies. Make sure you grab that link in the um, description below so you can get all those free study notes. And thank you for watching Biology Professor. See you next time.